Alright, so I decided to provide a recorded version of this lecture, and I'm going to break down this lecture into three different parts. Um, so it's going to be easier for you to see, and it's going to be easier for me to upload. First part, let's go ahead and go over the facial bones. We did go over this area in the head chapter as well, but this time I want to focus on the facial bones instead of the skull bones. Here, the green part of this facial bone, known as zygomatic bone, and this big arch that you can see, known as zygomatic arch. You see maxilla, which is the upper part of the jaw, and lower jaw is mandible. Nasal bone is located over here, and uh, inside of the eye socket, you can find the lacrimal bone, as well as the ethmoid bone, which is this small purple bone that you can see. Of course, you should know all these bones from the skull chapter, but make sure you know the temporal bone, as well as frontal, sepidal, parietal, and sphenoid. Taking a little closer look at the upper and lower jaw, you can see mandible, and, sorry, mandible here and maxilla. What you're going to see here is nice ups and downs of the bone, ups and downs of the bone. Those are known as alveolar processes. Taking a look at the mandible here, it's got the nice unique shape to it. You see um, this part right here where you have nice sharp angle. This portion is known as the angle of the mandible. You see coronoid process as well as the mandibular condyle or conda of the mandible. Facial fracture is a very common injury that you see in sports and frequency wise. You see number one is a nasal bone, number two mandibular, number three zygomatic, and number four is maxilla. Although it's not too common, sometimes patient can sustain the mid-face fracture that is affecting more than one bone at a time because those, those bones are very uh, closely located up against each other. So for example, looking at this picture, um, this patient sustained the nasal, zygomatic, and a maxilla fracture all together. These fractures are known as Lafort fracture. You don't have to know the details about this one, but if you really um, want to know, if you're curious, there are actually three specific types of the Lafort fracture. Lafort 1, across this way, two up and down this way and then three across this way again you're not going to see it in a quiz or a test but if you're interested here's a picture nasal fracture like, as i said this is the most common facial fracture and number three most common fracture overall often caused by the left below to the nose it is typically obvious because you can see it as an obvious deformity whether that's asymmetrical or sometimes looking flat Swelling almost immediately kicks in, and epistaxis is one of the most con most common signs and symptoms. Now, the word epistaxis is just a fancy term for nose bleeding. Lacuna is also not a possibility if they experience a massive amount of bleeding here, and it's the blood the blood start to migrate around the sinuses here. It might just sit there, creating the lacunae. You should definitely inspect the internal structure of the nose whenever you see this injury because you are going to have to roll out the deviated septum and or septal hematoma. So you might need to use something like otoscope or pen light to try to get the nice um, visual inspection of the nose. So this picture is representing a deviated septum. You can tell that it's not nice and straight anymore. It's deviated a little bit to the side. And this picture is showing, showing the septal hematoma. Not an external bleeding, but you can see that massive internal bleeding formation within the septum is start to swell up. If you detect that these conditions might be present with the nasal fracture, then you should refer this athlete immediately. While they're getting ready to be transported to the hospital, some of the things that you should consider doing definitely controlling the bleeding as well as maybe applying the ice pack over the nose to kind of numb the area just to kind of treat the pain. Just be careful though you don't want to apply too much pressure or compression with the ice pack in this injury. Epistaxis, since we just talked about it, again this is just a fancy term for nose bleeding. I'm pretty sure everybody experienced that at least one in, once in your lifetime. So how are you supposed to manage it? So the most most important thing you can do is you need to apply mild yet firm pressure right over here up in the nose 
and the key thing here you need to maintain a constant pressure for at least five minutes you could consider applying the ice pack again mainly to treat the pain because the bleeding um, is coming from deep inside of the nose so maybe applying ice pack over the surface is probably not going to slow down the bleeding per se but you, you could consider applying the ice pack more for pain than anything else I've heard this both actually some people told me they need to tilt your head forward some other people told me to tilt your head backward so which one is correct hmm actually the correct answer here is tilting the head forward is probably much better than tilting it back now some people think that if you are to tilt your head forward it's going to you know facilitate more bleeding it's not going to be very good but you know what if it's bleeding it's better that you just let it bleed out if you're going to tilt your head backward what could happen is that bleeding might possibly get in, in your airway and then start to maybe affect your airway or maybe the blood is going to go to your esophagus and then you literally start to swallow your blood which first of all it's not going to taste very good second of all if you swallow enough amount of blood you might get start to feel nauseated and then you might start to throw up and you have now another mess to clean up but you don't want that okay um, some severe cases, now most of the piss taxes, even if it looks pretty bad, as long as you maintain the pressure for a good 5 minutes, it's going to stop 90% of the time. Some severe bleeding though, you could consider applying maybe something additional, like a nasal plug, like a cotton or something inside of the nose to apply additional pressure. Not always needed, but in some of the severe cases it might be helpful. Tell a patient not to blow their nose. Now, they're going to want to blow their nose because they might start to feel the blood clot formation and they might start to feel the kind of a jelly-like formation within the nose. They may not like the feeling, might want to blow it. Um, but if they're to blow the nose, they're going to have to start the blood clot formation process all over it again. So tell them not to blow. Um, even if the bleeding has completely stopped, if they're to blow the nose, say for the rest of the day, it might facilitate the lead bleeding again. So tell them not to. Mandibular fracture um, occurred as a result of the like blow to lower jaw. Some of the cases that I've heard before, maybe athlete during the weight training dropping a heavy weight in their face. You're gonna see obvious deformity. This is a nice actually CT scan image of the mandibular fracture. But you're gonna see obvious deformity. So in this case, uh, this patient is experiencing a nice fracture here in front. Um, mild occlusion is definitely a good common sign of symptoms. So if you were to ask them to close their jar, they may not be able to close it all the way. Changes in speech, mainly because they're having some um, issue moving the lower jar. Oral bleeding, swelling, ecchymosis, you typically see that. And almost kind of a silly special test that you can perform is known as tongue blade test. You can use a tongue depressor, ask your patient to bite down on one side. And you're going to pull on the tongue depressor to see if they can hold the nice pressure. You need to test both sides. Um, if they are experiencing any kind of mandibular fracture, then the idea is they're not, they would not be able to close and then maintain a firm bite. If you ever suspect this fracture, again, this is a facial fracture, major condition, so definitely consider referral immediately. Um, while they're being transported, you could use elastic band-aid and wrap around the head to uh, provide a little bit of uh, stability to the bone. You might want to think about how you're going to maintain the airway. If they're going to lean back or lay back down, this really unstable part of the mandibular might start to compress the airway. So probably sitting up position and maybe leaning slightly forward is going to be the best position to maintain the airway. Next one is zygomatic fracture, again caused by delict impact, most commonly maybe some uh, patient will get elbowed in the face. Westbrook actually sustained this injury before, so here's the fracture, you can see the nice indentation, this is before the swelling started to kick in. Another kind of x-ray interesting view, but this view is the best for you to see this zygomatic fracture. So obvious deformity, maybe. In this particular patient, you may not be able to see the deformity, but what you see is a nice amount of swelling, as well as high femur in this patient. Um, accumulation of the blood over the anterior chamber of the eye. In some cases, maybe epistaxis, sometimes the lacuna, as you can see in this picture, and maybe even the diplopia.
which is a double pigeon. Again, immediate referral, apply ice pack for pain if you want to, but do not apply any compression. Maxillary fracture, so severe blow to upper jaw, not very common, but it could happen. Um, deformity might be a good possibility if your patient sustained this kind of a long uh, transverse fracture then maybe the gravity will take over and start to pull on this unstable bone and maybe their face will look a little bit longer than usual again malocclusion pain with chewing talking is going to be the problem epistaxis and diplopia is a possibility again just like everything else refer immediately and think about how to maintain an airway, sitting straight up and then maybe leaning slightly forward. Again, you can apply ice back, but with no compression. So this is the end of part one, and part two lecture is gonna be coming up very soon.